Welcome to the Nordic Mythology Podcast. I'm Daniel Farrand, owner of the company Horns of Odin. Before we get into today's show, I do have to do our plugs because it's how we literally keep the lights on, how we keep the podcast going. So if you do want to support the podcast and if you can support the podcast, the best way is through our Patreon and you get a bonus episode every week in the form of a Q&A. And then on top of that, we do bonus episodes for the bonus episodes, which are either story times where we, we do um, a reading with either Jonathan Lorenzen or Claire Moulet. Um, and we also do a creator episode where somebody from the Viking crafts world comes on and shows us how they do their craft, what they, what their inspirations are, their techniques, they'll demonstrate it on the show. It's a lot of fun. These have been liked by a lot of people. So if you do like that, it's just Patreon forward slash Nordic mythology podcast. It starts from three pound a month. So it's 10 P a day. It's, it's the cost of a coffee, probably cheaper than a cup of coffee once a month. And you get the whole back catalog of every bonus episode we've ever done is also on there and you can binge listen to them um so yeah there's at this point there's months months even probably even years of, of stuff you can check out of just extra material so yeah please do that if you can't obviously not everyone is can financially support but even just a a positive review wherever you get your podcast or you know a little like share on, on our instagram it all appeases the the algorithm gods because we all have to play that game now and try and i don't know if tickle the balls of the algorithm gods is the right phrase but i'm going with it <laughs> so that's I've, I've said it now it's out there that's what we're gonna do so if you here we are if you do, <laughs> yeah if you do want to tickle the proverbial balls of the algorithm god please help us just like and share it on on all the different social media platforms just at not anthology podcast uh, uh, and i guess on that let, let's start the show so i'm joined today by my lovely co-host margaret havga who you're here pretty much all month hopefully um, all of march at least yeah all march and then we're, we're gonna see from there and hopefully i'm gonna wrangle you into being here every week We'll see. Or I do have many, a PhD I need to finish writing, so we'll see how it goes. Yeah, you know. PhD, PhD. PhD. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and then we're joined today by our guest, um, Declan Taggart, who is Northern Irish, and we're recording this on mm -hmm. St. Paddy's Day, so either that's an amazing coincidence or great booking. I'm not sure Ooh. which. It really just shows that I haven't looked at my calendar at all until until right now yeah, it, could <laughs> it, it could be that i should be doing uh, something more exciting I also I mean, this is exciting. Social... don't get me wrong but something more stereotypical <laughs> maybe i don't know yeah, yeah I, I was gonna say i don't know what it says about your social circle that you're stuck here with us two on a on a lovely saint patrick's sunday evening i mean if it helps i'm wearing green and orange and i'm really pale so <laughs> it just says that my social circle is getting better green. yeah <laughs> But um, yeah, probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, <laughs> yeah, Jacqueline, can you give us a, just a, a, you know, a little intro into who you are, what you do, what we're going to talk about? Sure. Uh, thank you very much for having me on. It's a pleasure to meet you both. And I'm excited to get one of the Margaret episodes. Going to be oh. on one of them. That's cool. Um, yeah, so I'm a researcher at the University of Iceland. Um, I've just started a new project looking at, I suppose, warriors in the Viking Age, um, which is very exciting. That's a collaborative project I'm doing with people across some other really good researchers across Scandinavia and Iceland. Um, I did a project about morality and Old Norse religion before this one, looking at this is sort of there's an idea that's been held for a long time that the Old Norse gods weren't seen to care about their worshippers' behavior in life. You know, I think it's probably because a lot of the people researching it were Christians. And so just to have this assumption that pagans couldn't have sin, couldn't have this kind of like concept of human action and that the gods wouldn't be interested in it. If anything, the gods were a negative influence in life rather than a positive one. Mm -hmm. So that was fun. It's a really fun project. And actually, as with while doing that project, I wrote a game, which you very kindly said I can plug here at the start. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, it's, it was called, uh, it's called Choice of the Viking. And that's because it was written for a company called Choice of, Choice of Games, an American company. And it's, okay. a, it's a choose your own adventure, which maybe your audience will know. That's, like, it's I'm sure little, they will. Yeah. So it's basically like you're reading a novel and every so often, every half a page or page, you make a decision about what will happen next. Like, do you want to fight a dragon? 
do you want to make friends with the dragon? Do you want to yes. romance the dragon? You know, that kind yes. of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> to all three. Yeah. Yes, yes, so, yes. Sadly, you can only choose one. So Aww. it's basically a digital version of that, um, which you can buy on Steam and Play Store and places. And hopefully it's fun. It's based on Herpigia Saga, which is about the settlement of Iceland. Oh, it doesn't nice. stick very closely to the original story, but it takes like the magic and the ghosts and the Draugr, the zombie type creatures, mm -hmm. and the kind of conflict of religion from there. Puts it in and farming. There's a lot of farming. Um, and puts <laughs> well, it together. It's an, accurate, it's an accurate game, then, isn't it? I I, I tried to uh, I tried to make it as accurate as to the story, <laughs> to the feel of the story. I think it's a bit violent, so maybe that should be warned. Also but, accurate. Uh, yeah, it's true, but hopefully it's fun. <laughs> Um, it's a bit more irre irreverent. It's, it's like as a piece of Viking fiction, it's not so gritty. It's a bit more, um, like I read a lot of Neil Gaiman, Douglas Adams growing up, things like that, Teach Terry Pratchett. So hopefully some of that comes across, but yeah. You know. That sounds like such a cool combo. <laughs> I mean, I wish it was <laughs> as good as those three writers put together, but yeah, the, no, 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 most... no, you don't get to diss your own game while you're plugging it. <laughs> But, uh, hopefully, it's, I think it's I, I enjoyed making it, and I think some people liked it when they played it. So hopefully, I mean, more people will. Mm -hmm. yeah, I know we'll what see. I'm doing after work hours this week. Now. <laughs> You're very kind. Um, <laughs> anyway, before the game, yeah, I suppose the reason I'm on here is that I researched Thor for my PhD, and then eventually published a book about the old Norse god Thor, and really about his mythology and how it changes over time. Yeah, mm -hmm. so. That's really, that's the big thing. A lot of articles and stuff like that too, you know? Yeah, so we're here to talk. We're here to talk about Thor. Um, <laughs> yeah. be okay, before we get into that, I'm just going to go off on a complete wild tangent just because... Oh, I'm sure. Uh, Sounds good. Okay. Uh, no, so we I'm can talk about Thor next time. That's fine. No, 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 no. <laughs> I've listened before. I know what happens. We're going to talk about Thor, I promise. Um, but I, 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 I figured how many times I'm going to have a, a scholar in here on St. Patrick's Day and I, I just wanted to ask about this whole myth and argument about like St. Patrick kicking all the pagans out of Ireland and I don't know if that's anything you would know about but I thought I'd just ask anyway maybe it was something that Margaret knew about because I always see these memes on Facebook every St. Patrick's Day about like modern day pagans getting really upset about people celebrating St. Patrick's Day because uh, kicking the snakes out of Ireland was actually kicking all the pagans out. Um, and I just never really knew how accurate or true that was. Um, and I didn't know whether that was something maybe you would know as an Irishman. That could be very stereotypical of me to assume that every Irishman would know the answer to this. Well, I really don't know the answer at all. Uh, but I do know that I was taught that St. Patrick was great when I went to primary school. <laughs> So, and that definitely okay. all of the things people say about him are true. Uh, so I don't know, does that help? That's the only learning I have really with St. Patrick. Uh, I do, I did, I used some people who, who did research in Patrick and mostly they just said to me that the stories of his life, he's really not, he doesn't come across as a nice guy okay. in a sort of no, like the same slash. I, that's the same thing that I've, I've heard when I've looked into him. It's like, it does come across a bit like a, like a, like a dick. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Little, it's little, not even the first little, one. Yeah, a little uh, bit of an asshole. There the was a Saint Declan beforehand. Oh, of course oh. there was. Where's all the, Where's his press? You it's all I, PR. I feel like you've just taken the opportunity there to make up a saint and just put it out there <laughs> and like, there's a saint named after me. Give me Paul Patrick. I should Obviously, be the patron saint of Ireland. He might not have come beforehand. I can't. I can't be. I can't <laughs> really confirm that. Well, you heard it here, it did. 100%. <laughs> it's canon oh, now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's... Uh, we'll get into Thor then. I won't ask you about things that you... Actually, Dan, can study. I have a tangent question? Absolutely. Yes, because I was wondering, since you said you're now part of a research project in Iceland about warriors in the Viking Age, mm -hmm. I might be completely wrong here, but is that in any way associated with the research project on warriors in the Viking Age with the University of Stavanger? Uh, Oslo, the University of Oslo. The, the University of Oslo, yeah. It's a, the Viking Museum, I think, connected to the university. The PI is uh, Marian Moon. Federle? Oh, Moon? Oh, yeah. yeah. She's my boss. Cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So she's my Yay. boss, too. <laughs> nice. Hello, fellow colleague, extended <laughs> twice removed. 
So I've never actually met her in real life so far because we kind of constructed this across the internet, you know? But she's great. She seems really, really good, really smart. So I'm really so I sweet. should mention there's also a guy called Ben Raffield. He's taking he's another archaeologist, along with Maran. And there's a historian of religion called Sophie Bunding from mm-hmm. Denmark, who they're both great. They're my other colleagues. And uh, Christian Kushmans. I've never heard his name pronounced out loud because he didn't <laughs> say it to me. But he's Belgian and he's also very clever. Awesome. So, I mean, there is so many of us. There's so many of us, so I can't really keep track of everyone doing everything. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, of course. a lot of those names sounded very familiar. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So yay. Awesome. How's... Okay, that, that was my tangent question. Now we can get into the floor. How small is the world that it's you you're co- well, you I guess colleagues ish? I yeah, guess. I mean it would same be same boss, the same yeah. yeah. Peers, certainly. Pe- Peers, yeah, Peers. I like word. that. Better word, nice. <laughs> um, okay, so Thor is clearly a very, I'd say the most famous of all the Norse gods, whether it's down to, yeah, I would say he's more, even in modern day, more famous than Odin on a broad scale out to like the general public. I think whether it's down to maybe the Marvel movies or... I think you can scratch the maybe from that sentence, Dan. Yeah. You think, I like to just cover my own back sometimes, just in case. <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he, he definitely is. And obviously I've read... Um, Terry Gunnell did a very, very interesting article on the idea of Thor maybe being like the head of the, the pantheon in, in, in Nordic mythology. And there is a ton of milliners that are found and it seems like he was and obviously place names named after Thor so it seems like the chances are maybe he was the most popular historically as well um, I don't know where I was going with that that was just stating all the things that I knew about Thor but... <laughs> <laughs> I bet you know more if I'm honest I think you know more than that <laughs> probably do I probably could have um, no but um, so I guess it, what would be the start what would you what would you what, do you think the starting point would be in terms of this this figure that everybody knows and i guess do we start by maybe looking at what we do know to be historical fact because i imagine it's a case of there's so much that we know versus the um, absolute mass that isn't true and has been changed and adapted to and added to um over the the past thousand years um i i hate to be like a, a bummer like ac- academic uh give no go ahead answer, do it please but i can't be the only one much, you know yeah. <laughs> but i like i like that answer because that, that's what we're that's what we're here for so i mean i think I'm, sh- I'm sure your audience know especially people that are regularly listen to the podcast but most of the mythology that we have especially comes from one place it comes from iceland um, in manuscripts that were from the 13th, 14th century onwards. Um, from Sweden, for example, we don't have any myths that I can think of off the top of my head that are definitely about Thor that come from Sweden and nowhere else. You can see these connections between these two places. Um, for example, in Iceland, we have plenty of myths of Thor going fishing, which I think is always a spectacularly mundane activity to put in a myth. Obviously, he's, he's fishing a serpent so big that it wraps around the world. But still, you know, it's yeah. really fun. But and you see that on stones, for example, in, in Sweden. Um, mm-hmm. So you can tell there are connections between these two places. But we can... Also, there's a lot of variety between these two places in terms of the image of Thor we get, even just using those sort of scraps of information. So we can tell... We don't have all of... Obviously, we don't have every myth was ever composed about him. We probably only have a small fraction of this myth, really, mostly coming from probably, we don't know how old he was. We don't have anything from the Iron Age in terms of mythology, for example. And even the myths that we have might not represent everybody's viewpoint, whether that's Talking. on whether or not he's the head of the gods or just on even, for example, his association with thunder and lightning. So, yeah, mm-hmm. that's my long-winded way of slightly disagreeing with you, sorry. <laughs> no, I so, love that. That was the best answer. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Then I guess, what do we know from, 
as the from mythology as to like what can we say this is what people thought or saw um let's start yeah. let's start physically because oh. i think for most people thought has a very a very like physical appearance they can if most people if they close their eyes now they would probably get the the marvel thor figure but even yeah. then obviously iconically has his his hammer uh you yeah. hear things about does he have apparently some magical gauntlets a belt um, the belt's pretty well known yeah like uh, uh, how, yeah how accurate are these things like what do we his hair color i guess as well like physically what do we know for well we could take the hair color as an example um the hair color he's described in sagas from the 13th century onwards as being red bearded at least i think um but we don't have any evidence from before that period before the, these christians composing these tales about the settlement that he was he was ginger but he definitely has a beard for sure there's, okay. there's one myth that describes him with a beard i think maybe in some of most of the iconography is pretty simple so it's just a circle for example in the altoona stone with two slots for eyes basically um okay but this, there's there's a small figurine from iceland that's probably thor where he's sort of playing with his beard possibly creating wind that's one argument about that figurine uh, so i get he definitely has a beard whether he's a red beard in the viking age is much harder to say um even physically we don't get descriptions of, of gods very often and we often don't know who the gods are in the iconography we have in the images from whether um that's northumbria for example or scandinavia we, we can't be sure which gods which unless for example they're fishing that is probably thor um, right, but okay, in yeah. the mythology thor eats a lot you know the idea of him is that he's this hyper masculine we can say, we can say one thing about thor he's hyper hyper masculine he's the most masculine figure that you could possibly get and that's why mm -hmm. sometimes the myths make fun of that and undercut it and play with it um dress up in women's clothing for example or maybe even the short hammer thing that might originally have been a, a joke at his expense oh, it, <laughs> he's the it, most masculine that ever masculine yeah essentially so probably he had a lot he was huge probably he was supposed to be depicted in this way and then oh, this one of my favorite poems which i go on about a lot and nobody cares about is this poem called Hattelmund which i think is probably from the 1200s in iceland so actually probably composed by christians and these christians envision thor sort of um rambling through the landscape hunting um trolls let's say like giant essentially giants in the icelandic landscape and they're so big all of them that they're causing volcanic activity they're causing like eruptions like mudslides um and actual you know like uh earthquakes to be happening mm -hmm. all around them so that thor is huge obviously as well and i don't yeah. think the thor of the actual myths when he's fighting a well he's got a human sidekick so how big could they be as well anyway yeah i think it's very circumstantial probably how he would have appeared but there's some definitely some common features like the beard as you mentioned but even with that you can't be sure if he's even ginger yeah, <laughs> yeah. i also find find like proportions to be very interesting when it comes to like the myths and what we know about like for example the fishing story like the iterations that i've read that are translated obviously that i always found like the description of him pulling the midgasharm to him like with his feet going through the bottom of the ship yeah. and, like him planting yeah. them at the bottom of the sea and i'm like how does that work exactly yeah. really, really, <laughs> how, really. how did he not sink the boat if his Feet are that I big and i'm like genuinely have the same query 100%. Yeah. yeah and i'm like max this is this is a myth like suspension of you know disbelief, disbelief and everything yeah. and i'm like yes but this is ruining my suspension he's got, he's got really long legs have, have you ever seen the the cartoon uh inspector gadget but yes obviously i'm a proud child of the 90s of course it's i've well, seen inspector gadget there's, there's, there's your answer he's got go go gadget legs <laughs> okay, okay, I, mean, I was gonna right. say how do they possibly fit in the boat but you preempted that yeah brilliantly yeah See, then just comes in here and just schools us academics i love it it's true <laughs> you know sometimes it takes a simple mind <laughs> <laughs> I listen to the podcast quite a lot. You're, you're so self-effacing, man. I, so, I know. Uh, I'm working on it, but I haven't gotten far. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you seem very clever. Yeah. Just say. Who, me? Yeah. Uh, you ask great questions. Very incisive. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. I'll start blushing. I don't take <laughs> I don't take compliments very well. Um, okay, so we physically we've learned that he has a beard. Uh, that's, that's that's pretty much what we've got. Um, probably let's say probably just kiss. Pro- also, probably has a beard. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, you're right. He almost definitely. <laughs> he is mentioned at certain points having a beard, he so does. we know yeah. that in certain periods he did yeah. not shave. Okay, yeah, for sure. I, but um, most of the gods probably have beards also. That's another thing to mention. Like this yeah. one nickname for Odin that's um, horse hair mustache, I think. <laughs> oh, nice. 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 Yeah. Cool. So, <laughs> so one argument I've had a lot with people is everybody who's seen like the, the God of War depiction of Thor with like the big red beard and like the big power belly from... Um, almost like a weight lifter. And people say, well, he eats a lot in the myths. Like this would make sense for him to look like that. Um, is there anything to suggest that that's true? Because I always prescribe the the notion that he's a god. He can look like however the hell gods look really. I don't think the same laws of calories apply to, to gods as they do mere humans. But yeah, do we know, is there anything that says like, other than he eats and drinks a lot, that would suggest either he is that kind of rotund, heavy, strongman type, or the Chris Hemsworth steroid-induced mm-hmm. ripped type. I don't think there's anything in particular. I mean, there really there might be. There definitely could be, and it's just you know slipping out of my mind. I'd probably go to the uh, iconography more than anywhere else, um, and he's I guess slightly round in that okay. as well but it's i mean the iconography it's on stone so there's only so much yeah. you can do when you're incising you've got to go for quite um def- definite lines you know you, ha- you can't be messing around the zigzags mm-hmm. for example yeah. it's famously um, quite difficult <laughs> okay so the but the airland um figurine from iceland which is the one i mentioned before where he's got his beard and it's kind of pointing into his hammer mm, i mean he's normalish sized i suppose he's not are extremely proportioned in any way. I, don't yeah, think yeah. I mean, I suppose but. also the way, like how his body shape would be, would also then, if he is like the masculine that ever masculine, I suppose people's perception of what he would have looked like would then have depended on what was kind of considered to be masculine proportions at any given time. Yeah. I would, I would say yeah. that's very likely. And as yeah. you mentioned before, Dan, you can compare the Chris Hemsworth now with even the Valhalla comics. I don't know if you you know them from Denmark in the nineties. I think they were published maybe into two thousands. No, I don't think I have. They're really good comics. Um, quite different from the Marvel ones. And he has a red beard in them, and he has that more um classical figurine. Okay. Figure, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit, bit more rounder. So even that that depends on obviously the individual artist's view and probably social trends as well. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Okay, so we don't, yeah, we don't know for certain. I didn't know whether there was a description in any myth or anything like that. But again, there could be, but I can't think of it like my you, head. I feel like you would remember it if there was. Um, <laughs> I mean, not that I'm super well versed in all of the all of the myths, but I I gotta say that now that you mention it, Declan, that as far as I can remember, there are surprisingly few physical descriptions of gods mm. besides like if there are specific things that have happened like Sif's hair being shaved or something but yeah. then that's mm. it's something that happened to her but it's not like uh, that their physique is necessarily yeah. given of a, a lot of attention like we maybe expect from the way that we write stories today it could be that the, there are descriptions somewhere and i don't remember them as you as you don't either but i don't mm. think for example loki's ever described as super slender even though every depiction of in the 20th century of loki he's always this slender sort of guileful mm. character mm-hmm. yeah yeah i wonder if it was just a case of everybody just everybody just knew what they looked like i guess mm. yeah i think so maybe like it, but- it wasn't put into the mist because it was just kind of passed on through normal tradition and conversation you just knew you want to yeah but like, also also like yeah. um okay possible tangent incoming but i just started thinking about the concept of uh how you're gonna figure it in home shifter 
of like skin changing that like maybe their physique isn't necessarily what you would use to recognize them, but it's their personality and their attributes and their accessories and how they mm -hmm. behave that that's what kind of gives well, you an input to recognize a god, not necessarily if they have a red beard or not. Because technically, if we go by the little we do know by, the, please uh, in, like interrupt me and, and disagree if you want, Declan. But like, I'm just thinking maybe you wouldn't necessarily recognize them from a face, but more like they could change shape, mm -hmm. theoretically, it seems, at uh, least Odin. Uh, the f most famous story, probably, especially in relation to Thor, of the, the shape-shifting mm -hmm. is, is, is Fre Freya's the person that owns the, the skin yeah. Yeah. that they use. Um, it, it, I mean, we don't have that many references to that kind of process, I guess, happening mm -hmm. in myths. Um, and it being just in Freya, that might just be an accident of survival. It might be that many of the gods did, but they make such a big deal of Freya actually having had it, that yeah. maybe that suggests that she was the only one who did. But you, I mean, you're definitely right that nobody really knows what Odin looks like. That's part of, his, nobody recognizes him when he's wandering through the countryside. So he, so he could clearly change a lot. Mm -hmm. I wonder if Thor is the god that you're most likely to recognize. And yeah, yeah. I don't want to talk about Freyr from this point of view because if you've seen the Raid, is it the Raidlinga figurine? There's a, yeah. st there's a little figurine that people associate with Freyr over the other gods. Yeah, mm -hmm. I have a lot of issues with figurines being interpreted as gods unless they're very oh, yeah. specific attributes as to, like, yeah. you say, like the fishing scene. Like, then I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm inclined yeah. to believe it. But if they're just like, oh, this must definitely be a god, I'm like, please this one's describe why. This is yeah, a fertility like, oh. god for sure. Oh, my um, God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah. I mean, that, there might be something in what you say, for sure, that they could shape shift, <laughs> that maybe they weren't expected to be seen. Um, probably. I, I I don't know. Um, I, I I could get very speculative. Um, Go ahead. In terms, well, maybe not speculative. Maybe it's there's a big difference in, between myth and let's say prayer or or more sort of theological understandings of gods. Um, when you think of your god, when you think of the Christian god, even you think of that person in the sky, you know, that old man with the the beard. And obviously, Jesus is a person that was a person. Historically, yeah. I think. Um, so they're definitely people. But whenever you whenever you're praying to the Christian God, if you're a Christian, you maybe not always there's not always this human like image you have. You just have this like more sensation, this more abstract concept. So maybe the old Norse gods had this kind of duality as well. And that's yeah. I spent a long time with one of my previous projects looking at the idea of omniscience of no Norse gods. Could the old Norse gods see you? Were they expected to see you or not? Ooh. Yeah, I mean, and I think there's a there's a split there probably for me between myth and you conceptualizing of these gods as humans. But let's say you write to a god on a runestone, or let's say you write on a, a like a little brooch or something. You write a little protective charm. You flip that over. Nobody can see that. Like no matter how human like they are. So what's happening there? And that seems mm -hmm. like you're dealing with another way of conceptualizing gods. You aren't expecting them to be people-like. You're just expecting that, especially if you write something, they'll pay attention to that somehow. So, you know, mm -hmm. there's multiple sort of cognitions, multiple ways of thinking about gods. That's yeah. a really interesting point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, but that's a, no, but you're because like uh, that may also makes so much sense that it's like yeah, okay, human like in myths maybe, but then there's also this extra level of like, yeah, the just seeing things that human like creature won't see by default. Yeah. yeah. And there's I, this I, level I, in presence or consciousness. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think they get mixed up too. I think some some of that um. What's the word? Like those inferences, that those, those feelings that people have about their gods. I think that gets goes into the writing of stories about the gods too. You have this feeling that the god will be watching you. So, for example, then Odin has a chair that's magic and he can watch people from it. He has these birds that fly around and watch people. And I think mm -hmm. probably that comes from that feeling. In the Thor mm -hmm. stories, just, you know, I can tie it all back together. Um, in the Thor neat. stories, <laughs> there's not so much of that. Thor isn't really a god that um, seems to watch, but he's a protective god. You asked earlier about 
what's the core of Thor? And I think being a protector, being really strong, but also looking after the people in your community. That's that's really what he's about. And so when somebody calls out Thor in the myths, um, twice anyway, and they're slightly sketchy pieces of evidence, they're probably very late, but Thor suddenly comes running, you know, when people use okay. his name. So maybe that's also related to that sense of, you know, being watched by your God and looked after, being cared for by your God. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, that, okay, I, I want to save that because I want to get back to to that because I would like to go into the, the like the Christian influences into the the myth and how maybe that stripped away some of that like omnipresence, I guess, and whether they've tried to humanize them to 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 kind of make it a little make them a little less god like. Yeah. But um, to, to, to keep on the the theme of maybe physicality and and just to keep some sort of structure-ish as we, as we move, move <laughs> through the, the landscape that is Thor. Um, when it comes to his lovely accessories, what do we know to be to be true? What What's kind of mentioned as him having? Because like I said, I think I've heard obviously the hammer, uh, gauntlet, and maybe uh, the belt, um, and this idea of the Milner can, can shrink into a pendant to be worn around the neck is that a, is that something is that like a, a historic... that's more the the shrinking thing that could, again i feel i feel silly half the time i'm like is that a thing i don't think him shrinking milner is a thing to be worn around the neck that's more like um Freyr has a boat yeah. sleeves black new. that shrinks and you can put it in your pocket mm -hmm. which is really useful if you're like a viking oh. and a, oh, you know, that's super, to... super useful yeah, you can anytime you isn't need it? to like you can't go down a bit of a river, you can just put the boat in your pocket, walk, and then jump back in the boat again when the river's traversing. I wonder if that came from when they were traveling across through sort of Europe area and they would put the ships onto wooden rollers and push them from It river definitely makes to, me think of that. Yeah. River to river and work around and they're like, fuck this would be so much easier if this boat could just <laughs> shrink up and put in the bucket right now. Yeah. Yeah, for, I mean, I can't say for sure, but I definitely, it makes me think of that too. Yeah. Definitely. Um, regarding Thor's other sort of um, bits of clothing, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I think, not not talking about the hammer for a second, the other ones, I don't think they come up very much. Um, the, the belt, uh, for example, I think it appears obviously in Snorra Edda, which... Mm -hmm. Probably your listeners know Snorretta, if you're into Old Norse mythology, but it's this 13th century compendium of myths um, like brought together by a Christian, Icelandic, or Snorri Sturluson. And we use it as a key for mythology, really, because um, he collected so much and he's explained it so much more than the poems did beforehand. That's really useful to us. So in that, he has collected these bits and pieces of what Thor might wear in his description of Thor. Outside of, I think it appears in Thorstraupa, which is a much earlier poem, like a 10th century poem, I think. So that is attested somewhere else. Um, and it actually play, plays a crucial role in that poem because Thor, or uh, Kjalfi, um, Thor's servant, enslaved person really, is holding on to Thor as they're traversing this river because it's so strong. Only Thor is able to resist the current. But I think that that's... I mean, how widely spread an attribute like that is, I don't think we can say, because they don't appear that much. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously the hammer, Mjolnir, that comes yeah. up a lot. So yeah, that's yeah. his main means of interaction with the world, almost, you could say. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's, he's such a violent god. He's all about killing things. So that's really what he does. And it pops up in, it doesn't pop up in every myth. It actually doesn't appear in Thorstrapa, the poem I just mentioned. Really? Um, That's yeah, the, cool. so when Snorri's ex, Snorri gives like a prose version of it beforehand, and I think he says that he doesn't bring it with him because Loki tricked him effectively. Oh, that deep. explains it. I, I sometimes wonder if this the whole poem is really a creation myth, it's like a Iron Man's that origin myth for the hammer. Because at the end of it, the, the person he's battling throws some molten iron at him and he catches it and throws it back. And it goes through the wall and everything. And I wonder if that iron actually is supposed to be the the hammer being formed. Ooh. I mean, I'd never written that down because 
might be not true but <laughs> but again um, it's i mean it's cool to speculate about those things though yeah. right even if you don't have like academic grounds to maybe ar argue for it and kind of like a, the sense of a, a published article it's still cool to yeah. be like yeah, yeah. yeah i think the, the mythology is full of that those little crumbs you're like is this is this related to this i can't maybe i hope maybe this is exciting I mean, dude, um, oh, I, I work with yeah. iconography, so I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I, I, that brief, to be honest, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> well, thank Just you. Make it, making those things out is pretty impressive. It's a headache, but it's lovely. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Mjolnir does have its own creation myth, a much more established one, also mm -hmm. given by, by Snorri. Um, you sort of cited it earlier with Sif and her hair. Yeah. Um, yeah, the story of Mjolnir is basically if I remember it properly, that Loki's being bold, being a naughty boy, and he cuts off all Sif's hair. And one thing leads to another, he eventually he has to remake the hair as gold, effectively. So he gets these Dvergar, these dwarves, to help him make it. They make a bunch of other things as well. And I can't remember. It's essentially a, a competition to see which one's best. Mm -hmm. And he creates, I think he creates the 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 boat as well, Skiff Blathnir, um, and a couple of other bits and pieces. And yeah, the hammer is the best, but because Loki is a real trickster, he um, he he turns into a fly, I think. I haven't read this yeah. in such a long time. He turns into a fly, and he, he then he bites the dwarf making the hammer. Mm -hmm. And so the hammer is like, the process of making it is damaged. So that's why it's so it's short, yeah. rather than, yeah, so it's supposed to be much longer. Honestly, because that poem or that episode isn't widely attested elsewhere in Old Norse mythology, you get it's used to make poetry sometimes. You get these cannings about what gold is, and it might be related to Sif, for example. But the actual poetry doesn't really echo that many elements of it. The elements of, um, I think it says in that episode that if he throws me, it'll come back to him. You know, that really Marvel, important yeah. Marvel sort of dimension. <clears throat> I don't think that's fine anywhere else in Old Norse myth. That's so, really okay. interesting that like all of these things that have kind of been tied together in story, yeah. it's like, do we have grounds to know this for sure? Or did Snorri get this from sources that we don't have anymore? Like where, yeah. where does this come from? Like, not that he's necessarily wrong, but like we can't fact check his sources. Yeah. Yeah. God damn it. <laughs> I think a lot of people that come on here are probably quite negative about Snorri. I would imagine mm -hmm. because he is, because we can't fact check him, as you say, exactly. And he seems to make things up. And sometimes he's definitely influenced by his sort of Christian background and he equates angels with dwarves and so on. But he's the best we have. And he yeah. really seems to be trying to do a good job. Um, in the fishing trip story, for example, he gives two endings um, because he's not sure which one is the real ending. Or he says this one's more likely. But he does mm -hmm. give both endings, for example. So he's clearly trying to do a good job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, from I a scholarly perspective, from that, like, literally a thousand years ago, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, that is pretty solid work, even though we'd like to have more of his sources and it's unclear yeah. when he's making things up. But even yeah. the fact that he just, he gives two endings because he's not sure yeah. which one is, like, the quote-unquote correct one is, yeah. that's pretty... It's yeah. decent scholarly work. And I'm sh I'm sure every scholar would be, they'd rather have the work than not have it. As much as they complain about it, it's so much better to have it and be able to complain about it than it to not exist at all. Yeah. Uh, we would have no, we have so little information yeah. about Old Norse mythology without them. We'd be attempting to pick more of those crumbs and put them together, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what about this idea that only Thor can lift Milner, um because that is like a very marvel thing like thor's only thor is worthy to pick in and you get that scene where captain america kind of moves, yeah, the, a good scene. moves the, <laughs> the hammer just a little bit and thor's like no 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 no, no come on uh, yeah they spent so many movies building up to that moment yeah. as well it was so worth the payoff yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then he gets but stressed I, out <laughs> like the yeah. cinema like the cinema audibly gasps like yeah um, I don't think that, I, I don't think that's any basis in, in Old Norse really? mythology. I don't so think the, so. That's, see, for some reason, that's one that stuck with me that I just assumed that was always real. And I, 
I never really questioned it. Well, so there's a myth called Thrymskvida, which is one of the most famous ones. It's the one where Thor dresses up as a woman and it, it somebody steals his hammer. Well, yeah. In, okay, know, yeah. So I assume, again, it might be the situation where different people have different ideas about what's capable in relation to the gods. But it seems like if that myth is anything to go by, mm-hmm. people can take it. Yeah. Especially, and they, bring, they bring it into the room. I never thought about that. Like, don't they yeah. bring it back to him? Yeah, at the um, end of it, exactly. Yeah, there we go. So, yeah. trying to think of any other physical things. If you got any, Margaret, before we move on to um, a little bit, I'm trying to think. Well, does I, it, I, I have a, does he have a red cape? <laughs> <laughs> Not that I know of. Again, could be. <laughs> could have. Could have. I mean, just the notion <laughs> of what we. Thing constitutes a cape and what would be a cape at that time is not necessarily the same <laughs> this I is mean, a tangent but because you do textiles iconography and textiles do you actually do you know much about what people wore and so on back then or, okay are you ready for a rant <laughs> um so yeah. i said something wrong Did no, I say this no no <laughs> you have not said anything wrong but this is a point of contention that i have with the academic standard of how clothing is interpreted okay um is that we have fairly few examples of clothing from this time period. And you can kind of envelop all of Iron Age Scandinavia in that statement. Uh, so when I say Iron Age Scandinavia, I mean pretty much everything that is uh, like from around 500 BC up until when we here in Scandinavia deem the Middle Ages to start around the year 1000 depending on if you're in norway sweden or denmark <laughs> yeah. um and there are very like there are a lot of reasons for that but especially here in 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 norway but also other places in scandinavia the soil is fairly acidic so it's there's not great um grounds for conservation of organic materials like textiles especially if they've been buried so the places that we would assume that we would find clothing aren't optimal like in burials and stuff aren't optimal to preserve it um there are um pieces of clothing like uh Lendespre, um tunic that's been found in in um in kind of uh frozen uh contexts uh where the conservation is completely different so there's a lot of just like you said with the myths that there are like bits and pieces that you have to piece together that have been kind of then assembled from the way people are lying or from from inorganic materials like brooches and pieces of metal that's left that they've kind of tried to reinterpret. And I know that there are probably many, many other archaeologists and and textile experts that would also maybe correctly disagree with me on this, but I I very much, Dan knows this, he's tried to back me into a corner on several fronts and several occasions (laughs) on this, but I usually love to err on the side of caution, not because I don't want to give a straightforward answer, but because I love nuance. (laughs) And I love leaving the door open for interpretation. Uh, So I would say that we know some things, um, but the the rant that I was kind of referring to was that um, when I think about iconography and clothing, what we have, what we don't have, what's represented in iconography, is that unfortunately today, from my perspective, uh, clothing is inherently interpreted as some as something that is gendered. Uh, but the people that wear clothing in iconography are surprisingly androgynous. There are very few beards. There are no voluptuous shapes. There are no groins very often that are exaggerated. So there's very little to tell us about the biological sex of the people wearing this. And uh, my rant then comes from the fact that I have been now working for a year to try to dig up where our gendered interpretations come from. Why do we think pants or trousers equals a man and something that is long, similar to what we would call a dress today, is equal to a woman? Because I don't have an issue with pants being a man and, and dresses being a woman. I'm just wondering, why do we think that? Where does it come mm-hmm. from? And yeah. I can't find a single source <laughs> that gives us a reason as to why we think that. We, I just find sources saying, that's the way it is. And I literally had a conversation with our shared boss about this uh, a few weeks ago where she also has an issue with this. She's like, I don't know where it comes from, but 
uh, both of us have a suspicion that this is probably something that unfortunately has just been inherited from the 19th century and hasn't really been questioned because in the 19th century, of course, men, like men would wear trousers and mm -hmm. women would yeah. wear dresses. So obviously that's the way it had to be in the Iron Age as well. But then to me, interestingly, iconography of kings in the Middle Ages are famously not wearing trousers. They are mm -hmm. wearing long <laughs> yeah. outfits often. So that yeah. was my rant. I don't know if I've gone on to a tangent or I can't remember your question correctly, but uh, <laughs> uh, there you go. But wouldn't that come into... Um, because oh, I guess obviously the most famous skirt wearing gentleman would be the Scottish and the Irish for wearing the, the kilts. I think um, they off. I'm not quite sure. I think we, I think, but, I think it's got there first. Is, <laughs> yeah, probably. But isn't isn't the whole reason for for the kilt that it was easier to move quickly across, like the the Scottish landscape in in battle, um, than in a pant? Like that, this is what I this is what I was told by a Scotsman when I was attempting to lift this big stone outside his castle, which sounds like a really interesting story. Um, <laughs> anyways, um. I did like a stone lifting tour and there was a, this little castle and was picking this stone up. And he was taught, telling us about the, this idea of kilts that they were used as a, basically it was because you could, they could mobilize and obviously being quite guerrilla esque in warfare, I guess. Um, it, the, it was easier to move across like the marshland and the rough terrain of, of Scotland in a kilt rather than like a, a trouser. So I guess that would kind of make sense if, Scandinavians did a similar sort of thing when attacking shores. If it did give give some sort of warfare advantage, it would. It, I think it would make sense. It's not as they're not certainly not as restrictive. So I agree sure. with you, Margaret. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I don't have any grounds for for saying that it wouldn't be that or the case. I'm just curious as to why do we even mean it and like why why is that the kind of uh, consensus in the first place where did it come mm -hmm. from i don't have um, an issue with that being the case i just want to know why we think that <laughs> I, I wish i had something useful to say about kills uh, i really don't i'm sorry <laughs> but I, uh, you're you're uh you're, you're very polite rant um it reminds <laughs> me of i think it's called the welcome home motif that appears yep. sometimes and uh, there's versions of that where you have yeah, a writer the... and a person mm -hmm. and i don't think you, it's really that easy to figure out which gender either of those people are based on their nope. clothing. And I think people are really reassessing this stuff right now, I hope, anyway. Yeah, I read an article about that exact type of motif. So you got like a writer and then you got the person standing like on what would be surface level, I suppose. And the, that person is sometimes like seems to be offering like a drinking horn or something of the like to the writer. Um, and I read an article that was published, I think, in 2021 or 2022. Was it uh, by Lesha Gardewa? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and yeah. Neil Price. Yeah, where yeah. they were really struggling with this, yeah. trying to both gender the person or yeah. the people, and like also because the person on the horse is seemingly, if you go by the the outfit, seemingly a man because there are trousers involved, but then the hairstyle with a hairstyle being like a longer hair, but in a knot is often interpreted as being a woman and this person is wearing both pants and has a knotted hairstyle so what does that mean and i'm like see yeah. this is the problem <laughs> how are we supposed to identify if this is thor if we can't even like tell what gender or oh, the lyra um the little lyra figurine for example oh. on the, the throne like that's oh such a good God. example of this yes. we have no yeah. idea who that is Jesus anyway, Christ! Yeah, it's such a, I, I, I've seen that in person, and it's so, 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 so small. I'm sure maybe, yeah. maybe you have too. And it's, but it's so beautiful. It's, it's so cool. really pretty. It's really pretty. And also, yeah. uh, for the chat, if you guys want for the Q and A, I can see if I can pull up some pictures of this, so you can oh, see yeah. what we're talking Wonderful. about. Because mm -hmm. I assume that this isn't necessarily iconography that is just yeah. wildly. Yeah. No, I th <laughs> I mean, we, we got two inside we, baseball here. Maybe yeah. I, think yeah. Have, yeah. I think we've spoken about it before in one of the earlier episodes um i have one last physical question of thor and then we can move on to to other bits and that is we, i touched on it kind of before the show this idea that he has a a giant wet stone stuck out of his head because isn't that doesn't that get lodged in there and then doesn't it say that that stays there but you 
never really seen him walking around with a big stone stuck out of his head. I really think that's true. Yeah, this is a bit like the the foot through the boat thing. I'm like, somebody put this in the myth, and then nobody else paid attention to it. They kept telling the myth over again, but they just thought, oh, let's just ignore the whetstone in the head part of it. Yeah, the, yeah, the the stone's a bit of whetstone. I think it happens in a in a fight that he gets into. It, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it crashes. I think his hammer crashes through the whetstone. The the Ringnir, the I think it's Ringnir, the yeah. Jotun, the giant that he's fighting. Um, his whetstone breaks and something goes into Thor's head. And then there's an even straight, it finishes with an even stranger episode, I think, where he's on his way home with this stone stuck in his head. He meets somebody and um, it was, he's like, oh, could you take this whetstone out of my head? And they start to do some magic, essentially, to take the, to get the stone out. And, um, but then he tells this person that their husband is safe and at home or something like that. And so the person's like, oh, oh, then I need to go home then. So they just run off <laughs> and and they don't take the stone. I, I, again, I could be completely mistelling the story. I, uh, no, no, but, but still, I, it's like, okay, okay sure. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's sort of what's happening. I need to, I'm going to go check now. Wanna, well, after well, this, I'm gonna, how many details did I get wrong in the uh, uh, No, but, I, no, but, but I, we love this because then you can come back and we can be like, so yeah, per yeah. the last episode. <laughs> so many corrections. But I also think it's a perfect perfect example of how oral tradition would have gone. Because obviously these are stories that you've read, I'm sure, tons. You've read these, you know, time and time again. But you've gone and worked on other things and done other projects. Yeah. And now trying to retell it, you're you're trying to put it together. And you, you, you remember the main parts, but then you yeah. have to kind of fill the gaps because they're maybe not as clear. And I imagine that's exactly how oral tradition would work and why, and it's a good example as to why there would be a variation geographically. Yeah. Because yeah. it wouldn't, it's not a case of you've got this little book and you go, well, this is the story. It's, it's adapted and changed depending on how good somebody's memory was. And I'm sure their memory was probably better than ours today. Yeah. I, th I think, broadly speaking, we can expect people from the Viking age to have very similar brains to our brains. But even today, uh, yeah, we, we talk so much about how like little kids are so much better with touch to touch, you know, screen technology and stuff than we are. Mm -hmm. uh, so probably the change to literacy does mean the brain develops in a different way. I think. So I, I think you're right. I think we can assume that their memory would have been much better for these kinds of stories. Yeah, because I also think that, that there's a just a uh, like a difference in how you would recall things. Because for us, it's just such a a default thing that you you remember and you recall through writing. But if yeah. that's something that you don't interact with on a daily basis, yeah. then I suppose mm -hmm. I'm not a cognitive scientist, but I suppose your brain would develop in a way that would remember things or recall things in a slightly different way than we do today because we use different tools mm -hmm. there's this concept called i think it's extended cognition i'm not sure how current it is in cognitive science but yeah it, it essentially means that you get the exterior world to do some of the work for you so yep. yeah writing yeah. exactly so I think then right. again could be related to iconography you know like mm -hmm. maybe yeah. things that we have a hard time picking out today would immediately have you know visual clues Mm -hmm. yeah, there's some early poems that are based on iconography. People make up poems just based on, they get a pressing from somebody and make them a poem. Maybe it's about the shield that they got from them and the different stories that are um, painted on the shield. Or it's they're at somebody's house and they make a poem about the, the things that are depicted on the wall of the house. But maybe that fits with your, your theory. Mm -hmm. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, I, 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 think it, I think it's probably worth remembering that you know, these myths were, were told, I guess, in most part to entertain people. And they'd be told when you're at home in the winter and it around the fire or in like a hall. And they're made to entertain. So you things would be probably fluffed up, bits added, depending on the storytelling, how good they are. You know, you'd keep the key the key elements and the rest you'd kind of flow with and add. And probably each time telling to telling would be different because you would add something almost like a, a, a stand-up comedian works on a material the more they do it the more they find a bit like oh this works because this bit got a laugh this bit maybe didn't work people yawned 
during this bit. I mean, and I it was mean a living, to... breathing thing that changes. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you're right about it being a living, breathing thing, but I hate to be like the party pooper academic, but I don't know if I agree with the whole it changing purely for the sake of entertainment. I'll, I'll let no. you two sort this out. I, okay. I'll step back. <laughs> <laughs> I think, Switzerland? I think, <laughs> yeah, totally. I, I think there's many different reasons why it might, might change, for sure. Um, and maybe some things could be quite incidental, but this, there's a professor called John McKinnell in Durham who writes really, really well on the concept of change in variety in Old Norse religion. And he, for example, he talks about a poem called Hustropa, which is about Thor and fishing. And that poem ends, if I remember right, with Thor killing the serpent, which is obviously an issue if that serpent's supposed to survive until Ragnarok and fight mm -hmm. Thor then instead. So maybe the, maybe you could be quite free with the myths in some places. Maybe there's more than one version of the of the story of the Mikar serpent, and maybe that gets adapted to. Um, maybe maybe originally Thor did kill the serpent and. Then, whenever the obvious idea of Ragnarok became much more pop, more important to Old Norse mythology and religion, maybe the Thor myth had to adapt to that, so it changed in response to that. But the point that John McKinnon makes, which is really good, is that an audience can disagree as well. Mm. Like it is a living object, as you say in mythology. So while somebody can change it, everybody else can then say, "No, we don't like this, and we're not going to keep this version of it as well." So we have to assume, to some extent, that a myth that survived had some kind of consensus behind it i think that That's enough people liked really it to, for it to survive because it's an oral culture until yeah like the 1200s 1100s and the myths aren't getting written down until the 13th century for sure so yeah i think yeah. that's important mm -hmm. i'm, I'm yeah. thinking this idea of on a well there's many different this technology for memorization which is obviously important we have two different types of poetry we've got skaldic poetry and Attic poetry and the skaldic poetry is really it's more rigid than Attic poetry in terms of how it's remembered um so if that's less likely to change so if you tell a myth in skaldic poetry it's probably going to be told for generations in a similar way to the original composition but the Attic poetry the more famous poems like Trimsky, the Rula Spau, those kinds of poems they could change much more freely over time um and it's presumably up to the what to remember properly, but the process of remembering and telling, uh, people are working on that now, I think, and they're doing really interesting stuff. Like Claire Mulley, who's been on this podcast before, yeah. she's really interested in that now. And she thinks there's even, they build in pauses in the poems to give, that's like when you get a refrain in a poem, then maybe that's where the poet's going, oh, uh, what's next? Um, okay, give me a second. I'll yeah. tell this bit and then we'll move on again. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, really totally interesting. I, I recently read, um, this is from a while ago, The it's published, but that made me think of uh, Gru Steinsland, who's a religious historian who's worked a lot with, with Norse mythology, like yeah. in, especially in the 90s and early 2000s, where it was just like kind of a, 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 a sentence in, in a book that I have by her, where she just kind of mentioned, and I haven't looked into this further, but that a possible origin of the word Edda to begin with is... Uh, the word for a great grandmother, and that potentially mm -hmm. that could hearken to uh, older women being kind of responsible for passing on knowledge. And I thought that was just kind of an interesting detail, especially with the point you just made about Eddic poetry being more mm -hmm. kind of fluid. Yeah, yeah, I'd never thought of that before. But yeah, I, we have um, this idea of older people definitely as retaining legal knowledge, at least not been really well written on before. Um, we get these lists of um, poetic words which are kept in things called, I think it's Thula or Thula. And that actually is another word for an old wise person who's retaining this information mm -hmm. as well. And But I we tend to gender that. We tend to think of them as old wise men. But we also have this idea that the Eddic poems, especially, are handed down by women in the house. And that's maybe why there's like more of a Celtic influence. Like that's an idea from the 80s. I have no idea if people are still oh. writing about that. But That's interesting. But so, I, yeah, I mean, the gendered idea of who's passing on the mythology, yeah, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how if people have actually probably looked at that. No, me neither. <laughs> uh, it might be, but it might be that the word is actually gendered, but I can't, I can't remember. I can't tell. And um, I, sh I should note just for 
future ref if anyone's like listening to this later on i want to just kind of emphasize that this was just put in there as a possible meaning of the word not a yeah, definite nobody knows what it means yeah. you're right no yeah mm-hmm. yeah perfect okay um i can't touch on it before i would love to know your thought on how accurate the the myths we have can be particularly the written down ones um, oh, into, in, idea, yeah. into yeah because obviously we have that influence um and you get the stories uh so let's say i guess you know thor losing his hammer having to dress up as as a woman um or the story of Utgard to loki where thor effectively is embarrassed and loses because everything kind of everything you expect thor to be able to do um he can't do and he's he's outmatched in all fields of things that he would usually excel at, and and I, yeah, I wondered whether these would be traditional parts of the myth, or would they be these stories have been tweaked when written down by Christians to kind of like, oh, we want to write this down as like part of the the history of what these people believed before us, but they were wrong, so we're going to add these aspects in that humanize them and don't kind of, I guess, almost don't breathe breathe life back into this belief? Um, that's a really good question. Um, and it's definitely one of those questions that we cannot answer completely. Um, because even where we have uh, a feature of mythology that cr- crops up in Christian texts, um, and which maybe have in, might have influenced it, we can't guarantee that... Um, that people from the north who hadn't come into contact with Christian Christianity just didn't come up with the same idea. The most famous example of this is probably the idea of Odin hanging himself. That could be a Christian influence. It might not be. Even if it is, we don't know when that influence came into the Norse religion. If it came in in the 700s, does it matter that it was Christian influence? It's a functional part of the religion for people for a really long time. So the question of authenticity is a, is a really difficult one, I think. Um, I would though, I mean, answering sort of the spirit of the question, I think I tend to allow for the possibility that the myths have a long history in the old Norse religion. Uh, the poem of Thor dressing up as a woman, woman, for example, we can date poems to some extent, they're oral documents. So they're changing over time anyway. So it's the idea of dating them again, it's difficult. But people using linguistics can try to. Some of those people using linguistics date that poem to like the 1100s, maybe. Other people did it to the 900s. Well, so, that's a big difference. <laughs> yeah, it is. So it's really hard to know. The most recent dating, which coming from somebody who isn't experienced with this field at all, it, it dates it to the 900s, uh, a book by somebody called Christopher Sapp, which seems a really competent book, at least. So this, we, Maybe we can date these things to some extent. I think Thrymskvila is a good example too, um, because it's a poem, like, as you said, this mockery of Thor in some of these poems. Um, in another poem, Harbar's the Oath, that mockery might be because Thor seems to be against Odin in the myth. And so maybe there's like an element of cult competition between the two of them. That's always been the idea. There's somebody who is a huge Odin worshiper has composed it to make fun of Thor. And that's definitely possible because Thor's attitude in that poem to everything Odin's doing is this kind of like childish curiosity almost. He's getting mocked with this guy the whole way through the poem. He's being made to look like an idiot, but he really wants to find out what Odin did. He's like sort of titillated almost by what's happening in the poem. In Thrymskvila though, Thor is made fun of, but the process of him... So he's feminized for a long time in the poem. He has to dress up. He loses the hammer, but the hammer is quite obviously, I don't normally <laughs> go for phallic symbolism, but this one is so obvious. You can't it's, hard avoid to, it. it's hard to ignore it. Yeah. Yeah. So he gets his hammer's taken away from him. And Freya, this, this woman in his life, she starts off so meek and demure and the perfect woman. And then soon she's shouting at him and she's the, the, the power in the poem. So Thor is suddenly feminized. The woman in the poem is certainly a masculine sort of identity going on. 
and he's dressing as a woman and then he, he goes and he gets his hammer back and suddenly he gets his masculinity back he even put his hammer in his lap that's how obvious the <laughs> the symbolism is you know so yeah. he gets his hammer back and he destroys all the giants that are in the room with him he's supposed to get married to one of them the longer and it tells the story of um killing all of the giants in one stanza and then it spends an entire stanza talking about how he killed uh, the me and the ogre's sister. So it's like it's this complete reaffirmation of the status quo. All unnatural women are either destroyed or returned to their proper place in society. And Thor, you know, is also returned to his hyper masculine, like rightful status of yeah, in society too. So well, shit. I think that's what's happening in that poem, and generally. We can look at these poems from two perspectives. There's always, it's possible as Christian, it's possible that Lokasena, the story of the God being made fun of as Christian. But equally, if we look at it from that lens without trying to find, without coming already with the idea that these things are Christian, or Old Norse, we just look at the evidence, it gets a lot harder to come to firm conclusions about one way or the other about that particular question. I tend to err on the side of caution and then yeah. probably cautious optimism because if they aren't old norse documents then i don't have evidence mm -hmm. but yeah wonderful that's, that's uh, a very long-winded answer sorry yeah no i <laughs> love that i love that i love it yeah actually um, do you mind if i interrupt you for a second yeah you go what well, we, we were sort of talk we were sort of talking about theology earlier as well old norse theology um like this idea that you have the myths and then you have things outside of the myths in which the gods might be represented in a different way we might even have, um, maybe there's a lot of, there's a history of people intellectualizing the myths, you know, talking around them and essentially doing like exegesis is what it's called in Christian traditions, at least. And those kinds of elements of religion, they are likely to be forgotten. Partly they might be gotten rid of by Christians, as I think you sort of hinted at earlier. Why would a Christian keep this, um, these texts, I guess, about the gods, the old Norse gods, being powerful enough or godlike enough to challenge the Christian God in any way. It's it's easier if they are silly myths, you know, there's silly stories about gods dressing up in women's clothing or changing into whatever they change into, a donkey or a horse or female mm -hmm. horse or whatever. But also they're very hard to memorize. Um, you know, if you tell a myth, you're telling something that's exciting. You're telling a fun story. Yeah. A lot of the elements of it, they might change over time to keep it exciting as you mentioned before to keep it surprising to the audience but that other kind of text the more theological text unless you're learning every word rope by rope by rote that's just not going to survive outside of a literary culture mm -hmm. so some religions do keep those texts by rote learning but not the old norse yeah. one as far as we can tell and maybe they didn't exist but i also think it's one of those areas where we have so much absence that we can't say anything about it except to go Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. Do you think it makes them makes the gods more relatable to the people in sort of Viking Age, Scandinavia, I guess, um, because the gods are humanized a little bit and you can make fun of them and they're not some distant being that is faceless. You you can kind of they tease them, they, they make mistakes, but obviously they come back and kind of fix them and they're they're more like you and I. It could be. Um, um, I guess maybe it's nice, just completely speculatively, just talking about, from my personal perspective, if if the people, if these gods, these people that you put your trust in to order the world, if bad things happen to them and they fix it every time, you know, that must be a nice, comforting mm -hmm. feeling. And I think that's one of the elements of Old Norse religion, especially, probably most historical religions that we lose, is what does it feel like to be a worshipper of these gods? Um, you know, what, what, Thor, especially, he's this, he, he's maybe the easiest person to talk about from this perspective, because we have a god who has a huge impact on the natural landscape. Um, one of my big ideas has always been that we have, like, you associate Thor with thunder, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he his name means thunder, so clearly at some stage there was an association with that. 
Uh, in Sweden, we have a little bit of connection with Hymn of Thunder. In Norway, we have a little bit of connection with Hymn of Thunder as well. In Iceland, we almost don't have any. And we have all of the evidence about the god from Iceland. So that disappears. Instead, maybe we have a bit of a connection with volcanoes. And all these are these are different ways of like connecting the god to the landscape, probably related to how strong he is. Um, and again, so change, variety happening. But that's also you're feeling your God in that landscape. You know, if, if you're in Germany in the year 600 and you're interested in the proto Thor that was there, that, that thunder, is that fearsome? Is that like a reassuring thing? It probably means that you can feel Thor is out there fighting trolls, fighting the people who might steal your children, sour your milk at least, mm -hmm. you know, somebody, somebody's out there protecting you, but it's also scary. So, like the the feeling of what it might be like to worship such a powerful, strong God can be reassuring. Maybe you can be a great friend to this person, as they say in some sagas. I love but maybe it's that. also terrifying. Thor's out there protecting children and protecting your milk. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the juxtaposition between those two things is is beautiful. It's what I think. It's what the it's what, thunderstones. Um, we don't have any uh, references. I think to thunderstones really in the west of Scandinavia so much, definitely not in Iceland, but in the east, Denmark, Thunderstone ideas do survive from the early modern period mm -hmm. and later. And they that's we're often used against trolls. So they keep trolls away. Yeah. And souring milk is one of the big things I think the trolls do. Um, well, I mean, and that, all, yeah, yeah. That, that would be a part of the sustenance, right? So like, yeah. yeah. But I do it, also it wonder, thing. yeah, but I do also wonder, I don't know if you have an opinions on uh, any opinions on this, Declan? But like, I wonder if just from the tiny, tiny evidence that we do have of of kind of pre-Christian Norse beliefs, I do, and we can't quantify this or, or fact check it by any means necessarily. But I do wonder if, to what they degree they needed to be changed, like since it seems like such a different mindset and such a different way of interacting with the world and believing about like higher powers or whatever. Uh, insert whatever word you'd like. I wonder if there's also a, like a case to be made for did any like Christian author really need to change that much for it to seem weird, for lack of a better term, just because now suddenly the world is organized in a completely different way and the mindset has, from what we can tell, shifted so dramatically. It's a very interesting question. I love it. Um... I don't know. It makes me reminds me of um, there are some st stanzas of poetry from around the year one thousand. I think it's late tenth, early ninth, early eleventh. We're not really sure when. By a guy called Hatlefne, there other son. He's he's known as the Wandering Scald. I think in yep. his okay. in his book, and he's got these famous conversion verses, which are he's being forced to convert by I think it's Olaf Tryggvason, and sounds like him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he doesn't he's a bit reluctant and as you go through the the verses he gets more and more okay maybe maybe i will okay i i do hate i hate odin i hate thor i fine they 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 can be angry with me i don't care um but he's really expressing his fear of jesus in a way that isn't that dissimilar from his fear of the old norse gods he's saying that the power of jesus essentially is greater than the old Norse gods. And for that reason, I will worship Jesus, effectively. There's more to it. It's more subtle than that. But he's definitely, there's definitely a wilder, at least, in which the mindset isn't isn't necessarily different. I, mean, I suppose that's oh, if somebody's yeah. reverting that's during cool. their life, you know? Yeah, that's a cool point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, maybe, in the, I mean, when we're talking of Snorri Sturluson, that's a lot later. That's like 13th century that I think we're supposed to see it the edit to. So, yeah, I can imagine that there... In Iceland, we still have pagan sacrifices until the late 11th century, at least. Um, but still, that's 100 years after of Christianization. More than that, probably. It's, it's 200 years since the conversion of Iceland, official conversion of Iceland. So that's a lot of time for a mindset to change. I, mm -hmm. I'm, I think it's a really good question, because I'm never sure how, how much one religion is really that different from another one. Mm -hmm. um, because every everybody who is in a religion, wants certain things. They want protection. They want salvation, maybe. 
they were, you know, there's certain psychological benefits they want from it. So I don't know. Definitely they are different. There's different frames of reference and so on. I don't know. As you can tell, I love the question. I don't know how to answer it. <laughs> yeah. And I don't really know what my opinion on it is either. <laughs> but I'm just like... you want to go off and write a huge paper about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really good. You should write that paper, I guess. I mean, let me know if you if you want to collaborate <laughs> on that at some point. <laughs> That's cool. Wonderful. Uh, okay. I've got, I've got two questions I want to ask before we, we wrap up and do the Q&A where we let the patrons ask you some questions. Um, if anybody wants to get the Q and A's, uh, as I said before the show, it's it's on Patreon for us. Not mythology podcast. You get all the Q and A's we do with all the guests after the show on the on the lowest tier, it's three pound a month, and it's basically just an extension of the main show where we just chat for maybe another half an hour, twenty minutes. Um, all the the patrons get to ask questions. There's a bunch of questions that me and Margaret probably have missed. The the patrons always come from a different angle sometimes of just things that we've overlooked so they're always pretty good and there's a there's a bunch of knowledge to be had in there so that is just patreon for slash naughty mythology podcast but my my last two that, that spring to mind um the first one is i can't remember who it was that was on here um we were talking about um milner's the the the, the been found in graves the little dependence yeah dependence um I was and thinking about said, that earlier too. Yeah, and, and they said how they were pretty much exclusively found in female graves, um, and I wondered your your thought on that when it comes to Thor being this very hyper masculine figure you, that you would think would be associated mainly with men, particularly warrior men, and you'd have uh, you would have this idea of mainly like warriors wearing the little. Hammer pendant taking him into battle for protection, but the evidence seems to suggest that it was mainly women that wore the little Milner uh, pendants. Yes, Margaret, thank you for putting your hand up. <laughs> can I add a caveat question before <laughs> Declan even gets to that? Uh, do you have an opinion on whether or not those pendants can even be attributed to Milner specifically? <laughs> I will answer that one first because I find that one easier. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I mean, for a long time, we couldn't be sure that was even a hammer. Uh, there's a Danish scholar called, I think it's Lassie Christian Arbosana, something like that. I'm very sorry for the mispronunciation of everything. It's fine. Um, he's, he wrote a book about Thor. It was really good. It was tearing everything apart. It was the most, we have no evidence and therefore we don't know anything book. And I liked it a lot. It got some, you know, it's, it, got, it got criticized for being so hardcore in that direction because if we don't have evidence, we can't say anything. So should we just not do history? You know, if we don't have anything reliable? Which is I, love those, too, but... uh, I love those works because then you kind of have to rebuild. Yeah, I think that I think that's there's a nice tension there, actually. And I, so I like his kind of work and I like the other people that are much more open. I think that's really, that's productive academia in a way. Mm -hmm. Um. But I felt bad for him because he published and he spent like seven pages being like, we don't even know this is a hammer. And then maybe a year later, we found a little pendant that said, this is a hammer on yeah. it. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. we can't say it's definitely me on that. Um, for me, <laughs> imagine, it seems if someone, like... imagine if somebody found that and then just wrote it in there just to piss him off and then put it back in the ground. It was like, just, but thank just God it was it. found after the publication of the book and oh, not yeah. right before. I, I feel bad for him either way, I suppose. Yeah, it's that's true. Work, but he could have fixed it. Yeah, yeah. that's true. But, yeah. no. So I think it's a good point. Like, as with almost any iconography, uh, it's difficult to be sure that it is definitely uh, Mjolnir. I would say that in this case, it's most likely to be that. I would go, yeah, probably. We can't say that every woman figurine or even any woman figurine is a Valkyrie. But I think because we find the hammer... It seems a lot like a hammer so much in iconography as well on on stones that are raised and quite similar shapes to, um, for example, with Thor holding the hammer. Thor's huge association with the hammer, the popularity of Thor in all of these places across Scandinavia. I don't know how much commonality there is between, I think we find dependence in quite specific places in different periods as well. But I don't know if there's much crossover between place names, for example, and these finds. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But from, I would err on the side of saying, yeah, probably. 
um, especially because we find other pendants that maybe we can associate with gods. Although I think that gets harder at that point. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't know. Do you have a perspective? I'd love to hear it, actually, if you do. Either way. I Either don't... I am fairly comfortable with it being a hammer. Um, mm -hmm. But I feel like uh, I haven't looked into it enough to have an opinion on whether or not it can be contributed to Mjolnir, but I'm not necessarily yeah. against it being Mjolnir. Yeah. But then, but that also far. then comes back to Dan's question about it primarily being like overwhelmingly, like an overwhelming amount of them being found in in female, what is interpreted as female burials, both biologically and, and typologically. Typologically meaning that we identify female attributed objects if there yeah. isn't a skeleton left. Um, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But like that comes back to that question of like if he's like the masculine that ever masculine. What would then yeah. this being overwhelmingly found in what's gendered as female graves? Yeah, come down to. I don't know. I I wanna I wanna let you answer that before I have an opinion. Uh, I really don't have a good answer to that one, so I can't wait to hear your opinion on that one. Then, um, I can, can I go back to the the caveat question actually for one second? <laughs> <laughs> this is stone get, called. You're not getting out of it. <laughs> this is stone called the Henning Stone, I think, in, from Den Henninger, maybe stone from Denmark, and that has a hammer on it, and that seems like that isn't related to Thorn. Actually, that one's probably too late. Is the idea? So that definitely makes the situation more ambiguous. And a lot of the hammer, these little hammer symbols that do appear on them, almost like swastikas, um, and a lot of stones came from Denmark and Sweden in that period, and they are so ambiguous as to be anything. I think they're a lot harder to say than the pendants. Mm -hmm. But equally, and I, I I keep going, this is how I write as well. Everything is, we have this evidence, but we also have this evidence. But no, there's this piece of evidence. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you know about the Thor Vigi uh, rune inscriptions, if anyone does. Um, there's some, there's four inscriptions we find on grave monuments in southern Sweden and Denmark in which Thor is asked to bless either the monument or the, the runes themselves, which is a right. really interesting circular sort of circular blessing. Why do you want to bless the thing that's doing the blessing? You know, yeah. Um, I think that works like holy water. I think it's this transportable sort of inscription. You put it on anything, it does whatever you want to. Mm -hmm. But um, this again, go back to John McKinnell, who I mentioned earlier. He's done a book with Rudolf Simek, where they look at all the runic inscriptions that might be related to religion, and they they suggest that maybe. The Thor runic inscription, the Thor vague inscription, and the little Thor hammer symbols are the same. That the hammer symbols are just visual representations on the monuments that are put there instead of the inscriptions. Mm. I don't know if it works. I think I think maybe you'd have to go through all of the inscriptions and check. And I don't think sure. all of them would function that way because there's so much other many other types of symbols on those stones. Some of the Christian elements, for example, I think. Um that maybe that gets harder. But yeah, that's a footnote to what we we're saying earlier. Mm -hmm. I know we have to go back to the question. I don't have a clue why. <laughs> if, if you don't know, if you don't have an answer, you don't have an answer. That's I, I just don't know the pendants very well. I'm, I mean, I, as a historian of religion, which is kind of what I primarily think of myself as, you end up as a very much a jack of all trades. Um, and the, the jack, the, the trade in which I'm the least jack of is probably archaeology. I, I really don't know much about it in general. Or even the sort of history of the of the pendants. So I can't, I, I have to trust you really when you say they're mostly in manuscripts. It, it reminds me of something I read 10 years ago. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'd say you're probably right. It, it, he is definitely in the mythology very associated with women, um, with preserving the status quo related to women. He protects women a lot. He protects his daughter, for example, from being married to a twerger, a dwarf, which obviously nobody would want. Um, he, okay. I think he, I think he kills more women than he kills men. Yeah, he's not, he's not a guy. He's not a very good guy. No. Yeah, yeah, that's nasty. Um, it, so it, even one of the poems is a poem called Hundelios, which in which it says early on, there's a there's a giantess, let's call her, who is attempting to get the favor of Odin and Thor, more or less. It's kind of a complicated start. It's a bit weird, but the Freya is attempting to help this giantess and. And there's a bit of back and forth, essentially, because they think Thor's never going to help a giantess. He's just not into it. Um, so, yeah, his, his, his relationship with women is difficult. 
And it really does seem to be all about maintaining the status quo. Um, I think he protects people in general, but I think he probably is slightly more associated with protecting women, with looking after women. And maybe that's partly why, um, in that, again, I keep going back to Trim's credit, just a deep well. Mm-hmm. In that poem, he, he, his hammer is stolen and the ogre wants to marry Freya, essentially. And that's why he pretends to be Freya. He dresses up as a woman and he goes off to marry the ogre. Um, I think maybe that's one of those places in which this just flipping upside down your entire conception of what Thor is. It's playing with that. It's kind of teasing him by saying, this is the opposite of what Thor should do. Thor should be protecting Freya in this situation. And in one other case, after this is a famous war between the Aesir and the Vanir, the two, or yeah, between the two families of gods, essentially. And the wall of Asgard is knocked down. They need to rebuild it. They get this giant builder in which is a mm-hmm. motif that appears throughout folklore in Scandinavia for a long time afterwards. And they end up promising to the giant builder that he can have the sun, the moon, and Freya as a wife, I think. Yeah. And Thor essentially says, we can't have this. You know, and he kills, even though he shouldn't, he breaks the olds and everything, and he kills this, this builder to protect Freya. So I, I think, yeah, he is hyper-masculine, but maybe especially associated with protection of women, and probably because of that hyper-masculinity. It was a big deal in the early medieval period, the Iron Age. Mm-hmm. Who got married to who? Who had access to the women in your household? Yeah, as far as I know, anyway. I feel like that kind but, of answered the question, to be completely honest with yeah. you. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I very quickly that. was like, let's move away from, from graves. No, but yeah. does he, but like, I don't know what the graves mean, but from my experience, he yeah, is very I much like associated that. with, you know, women. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, much. okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. answers the question. You did a good yeah. job. Uh, okay, my my last one before we we wrap up and let the patrons ask some questions. Um, the Gosforth Cross. Hmm. Are you you familiar with it? Again, I haven't looked at it in a while, but yeah, it's this kind of um. Yeah, I appreciate you asking me this time before. I... <laughs> yeah, so let's uh, say I am. Let's say I am and move on. Yeah. Um, no, th- <laughs> I guess the, the question is. I guess first of all, I find it a very fascinating. Cross and am I right in thinking that there is? It reminded me. I, I thought of it earlier when you mentioned Thor fighting Yomanganda because isn't that one of these the images yeah. on there? But am I right in thinking that above Thor there is a an image of the Christian god holding a snake, kind of in like this weird, um, I can do what you can't do kind of image and i don't know whether i've just read that as maybe a, somebody's interpretation of it and i'm not sure if that's 100 percent accurate but i found that quite interesting this idea that there is a, a picture of thor kind of doing this thing that he's no fire especially especially from for the most part is associated for not killing yomaganda and then the idea that kind of the, the christian god is like yeah. oh well if you can't do it i can do it and this is the the snake I think you answered your own question. I think I honestly, it's basically a Christian document. Um, and we talked a little bit earlier about Chris, you know, whether Christians needed to change the mythology or not. And I think that's this, this, the cross is so interesting because it is, I mean, it's carved by Christians and I think yeah. you're right that there's a Christian message happening there and um, depicting and retaining the old mythology, but then giving it a new meaning for the new world. Maybe. So maybe it brings in, Topics that both of you brought up earlier, actually. Yeah. Again, the, the gospel of the cross isn't something I'm that familiar with. I haven't looked at it in a long time. But I wish it's definitely they, very cool. I yeah. wish they'd protect it. It's just kind of out there. I mean, I, I thought it was inside. I, I think I went to visit it once and it was in, I thought it was inside of a church. Oh, is it inside? I thought it was outside. I've never, I've I never been there in a long all, time. But all the images I've seen of it were kind of outside. And it looks I could be mixing up with another cross. This seems like a, a very relevant theme to one of those videos you do on Instagram, Dan. Maybe you go I, and visit. I, I would like to go and visit it. It's about three hours away, and it's one place that I really want to go and see. Excuses, it. excuses. I know. I will. I will go because um, there was the same idea with the. So someone theorizes a similar thing with the the bound devil stone, which is the one that people often associated with being Loki, this figure of like uh, a kind of figure bound across mm-hmm. the middle with like a, a chain and the hands are bound. And 
it looks as if it's part of like a cross shaft and the idea is that possibly there was like a christian god above it in the, in a sense of like i can bound bind the devil as whether either whether it is loki i don't know i I'm not really too sure why it's tested so much with Loki, the, the Bound Devil Stone. I don't know if I agree that it is Loki, but I think it gets classed as one of the two depictions of Loki, but it could be quite cool to have this like idea of yeah. a similar way to the Gosford Cross of like the the Christian yeah. god kind of doing what the, the 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 Nordic gods couldn't do. Yeah. And kind of removing the threat of the end of the world as well. Like yeah. That's a well, good point. religion is interesting because it is this kind of millenarian religion, if that's how you pronounce that word. Um, like, you're always scared that the world's about to end. Like, but it doesn't, like, this, I know we're about to go into the Q&A, uh, Dan, but, like, on that note, um, my my perception of it is, like, yeah, the world is going to end, but it seems like it, th there is a self-continuation where it's like, yeah, the world ends, but it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Like, it starts anew and then rinse and repeat. Mm -hmm. You... I this the the major impression that we have from the mythology that survives. Um, that's that's the dominant one. There's kind of two different visions of the end of the world. Um, yeah, because I've struggled with understanding that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I gotta admit. Like the the version from Volospao is kind of as you suggest, and Balder comes back, and so does his brother, and everything's seems like it might be pretty good again, at least for a while. The Draft Wreath and Smell, another poem, a uh, really important poem, that world is set to end, and some humans just hide in a forest, and they oh. escape the end of the world, basically. Four times. And uh, one of the, like, nearer than I think it is, one of the Vanir, the other family of gods that isn't related to Thor, he just goes back home. He, he, he avoids the whole battle and everything, just says he leaves. Yeah, I think he I just goes, right. nope. <laughs> yeah, I'm not interested in this. I'm not, I am not. didn't sign up for this. And so the world survives in that one too, but it's, it seems like it's more of survival. Then it's like cyclical. Um, okay, so it's more of a, like an ap 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 like an apocalypse type thing mm -hmm. than a rebirth. Well, it, it seems I think the word is not reborn but regenerates. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, you do have the last generation of gods dying, but there is there's a symbolism in that instead of Balder and um, his brother surviving, they have um, Thor children. Instead, picking up his hammer. Yeah. Actually, I think they pick up his hammer. Do I remember <gasps> that right? Da, 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 da. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that might be wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, it's kind I of have now. a terrible memory. I, I really do have a terrible memory. <laughs> um, so I'm a bad like example worry, of buddy. oral oral transmission of, of information here. Mm -hmm. Actually, the Gosford Cross is almost definitely outside. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I feel like it's getting more and more weathered, which is disappointing. Oh, Magni, according to the chat, so um perfect okay let's let's wrap this up and then people can ask you some questions so if anybody does want that again it's just patreon for us not a mythology podcast you get all the back catalog um margaret let's start with you what are what are your places mm -hmm. where people can find you and what you do well as per usual i'm pretty much just focusing on instagram at the moment when i do post things occasionally so that's archeo mags on instagram archeo with a k well, that's perfect yeah, Declan, plug plug anything where you want people to find you. Or if you don't want anyone to find you, then plug the game again. Or do both. Um, I would I'd like to plug the game again, I guess. I mean, obviously I get paid for it, so I have a you know interest in doing this. But I I I I think I hope people like it as well. You know, I want people to play it and like it. It's a weird, I spent such a long time on it that I hope people do like it. Um yeah, yeah you can find the game Choice of the Viking on Steam on play store maybe apple store too i think and uh, if people want if anyone would like to get into contact with me they can find me on twitter at dc taggart i don't use social media very much though okay. i'm very sorry about that um, I'd like don't to, apologize if somebody actually wants to write me a message the best place to get me might be on academia that edgy and i will respond to any message that i notice has appeared in my inbox. And I'm very sorry to anyone who's messaged me in the past and I didn't notice. <laughs> Some really nice people message me sometimes. Nice. So. That's the politest plug I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> it is. It is, yeah. Uh, so everybody go and buy the game and play the game. Yes, uh, yes, yes. I'm, I'm going to, and I'll give you some feedback and let you know. I, can, I appreciate thoughts. it, really. Um, then we'll get better. From... But yeah, wonderful. And <laughs> if if you want to follow me, it's Daniel underscore Farron one. Still someone out there with 
it and they don't use it and it drives me insane. I want to get rid of the <laughs> one, but <laughs> um and then yeah, just the business, Hosbrod, and then again, Nordic Mythology Podcast across the board. Uh I'm just working on some cool designs. We're gonna be releasing some new merch soon. So that will be fun. Um but yeah, let's jump over and do a QA. So it's so a Declan, thank you for for the main show. And then hopefully people will follow us over and hear a little bit more. <laughs>